why do you want to do this? Those who were, who were here last year, I gave a very, very fast talk, uh, basically saying that if you look at all the stuff in the US, in the America, you have countries and you have states and all this kind of thing, and you estimate the ancestry of each state, the country, you correlate, you get positive with European, with everything good, and bad for the other two, uh, which are Amerindian, Native American ancestry, and uh, African ancestry. And so these were aggregate results, so they're kind of costly and ambiguous. Maybe, maybe you didn't want to trade with the Africans or something. You know, you cannot <coughs> make an argument based on that. So what you want to do is that you want to get individual level data. And um, you can't get that and um, because uh, we have now medical studies, I think it's in here, yes, medical studies. You see, there's medicine, medicinal geneticists. They look at people and say, Mm, so blacks, uh, Africans, they have more hypertension or something, and they wonder, is it some kind of socioeconomic thing, or is it a uh, genetic thing, how can we help them? Yes. So medical scientists, they have a lot of research money, so what they do is that they get a lot of money, so they take genomic samples of people of mixed ancestry, right? And they have their disease stuff, which we're not interested in, but they also, because they want to control the socioeconomic, they have estimates of ancestry at the individual level and the socioeconomic outcomes. These are kind of scattered around in lots of papers and no one has meta-analyzed that yet. So, there are some people who did some narrative review and say, yes, European ancestry tends to be positively associated, but since no one meta-analyzed it, it's not so trustworthy. Narrative sometimes is wrong, as Richard Lynn mentioned. Um, it's still not, um, totally free of confounds, but it's better than nothing. So, basically there are two causal models you want to test. Maybe, maybe, well I forgot to include an error, but maybe you have this ancestry, and they call it biographical, it just means race ancestry, just a more fancy word, and uh, people with more debt, they have some racial features, and maybe that leads to discrimination, that therefore leads to lower income and lower education, and all this kind of thing. Or, maybe it's statistically associated with more cognitive or personality trait or something, and therefore more income. Yes, so these results are causally ambiguous. Uh, but still, a genetic model does imply that you should see these associations. So it's a weak test, but a useful test. Okay, so method. Uh, basically, read a bunch of papers, find the stuff, then you code them, and um, a lot of, uh, the authors in this area, they don't report correlations. And though maybe some you have email all of them, and sometimes half of them will maybe give you an email answer if you can even find their email. And so you get a bit more data like this. And um, you exclude the ones with very low ancestry or something, because if you're looking for an effect of African ancestry, and you're looking at, say, Europeans, there is no African ancestry, you cannot do a correlation with no variance, <coughs> you exclude those. Then you meta-analyze what you get after this. So, um, complex hierarchical nature of this data because one study may have multiple samples and one sample may have multiple outcomes like income and education and uh, one sample can have multiple ancestries. So if you analyze, for instance, the relationship in one sample between, say, African and Amerindian and European ancestry and income, you have three different ancestries with the same sample. So if you just took all these associations, put them into one meta-analysis, you have dependencies in the data. You can't do that. You, your errors would be all wrong. So you have to get some kind of hierarchical methods to analyze this data. So just to begin with, we found 41 studies. So lots of studies, 60,000 samples, including your thing. The recent case is different, of course, some papers have more than one sample. And uh, yes. They don't want to share data, so if they don't reply to email, you can't calculate them, it's useless. Okay, so what's the simplest kind of meta-analysis you can do? Sometimes they don't report the effect size, but they do report which direction the effect was in, right? And you can meta-analyze directions. And uh, what you do is, some studies have more than one outcome, so you kind of have to aggregate within study first, which we did simply by coding the positive associations as one, the negative as minus one, and the null zero and you take the mean within each sample. So you get rid of the hierarchy uh, dependency stuff. Okay, so what do you do? Then you simply get the mean direction. So you can see of all the reported uh, associations for African ancestries, 64% were negative, and for Amerindian, 80%, and for European, they were 80% positive. 
these numbers are not weighted by any sample size. And you, if you have a very small sample, you can get the wrong direction just because sampling error, these effects are kind of small. What are we predicting here? What's you're the dependent you're variable? That aspect. You're looking at any kind of uh, income or education, something like okay. this. Any kind of socioeconomic outcome. Okay. Um, so if you weigh the studies instead by sample size, you see these directions become almost one. So if you just look at the very large studies, they almost always go in the right direction that you would expect, African, less income, European, more education, this kind of thing. And you can also wear, uh, weight find the square root of n if you think that's better. Uh, yeah, sample sizes combined very large because medical studies, sometimes studies will have 10,000 samples. Okay, suppose you're not satisfied with these directions because they don't tell you how large the effect is. It's just maybe if you have a huge sample, you can see a very small correlation that's high significant and totally useless at the end scene. So what you really want is you want the effect sizes and uh, lots of studies, as mentioned, they do not report effect sizes, but those that do, you can analyze those with standard measurements and stuff, and this table is somehow wrong. Okay, it's a conversion problem. Anyway, suppose you get all the correlation with the ancestry and you do those by ancestry as well, and you get the simple means, minus 10 or so for African, minus 14 for Amerindian, and about plus 15 for European. These are just means, and medians is probably better here because a lot of uh, heterogeneity uh, between these studies. But the results are similar to the directional. And um, if you look at, say, the centiles, just to get how robust are these effects, you can see Euro European, even the 10 centile study, still finds positive, while for uh, African, no, uh, yeah, African, you can see some of them find positive associations. So maybe it's, maybe it's some kind of weird thing. Um, However, it's more proper to do random effects mass analysis, and uh, this is how it looks like for European. And so everything is positive, you see, except for two studies, and we will know the name of this one, Zhu et al., the fifth sample in that paper, that paper has eight samples, as you see, and the other one up there has the sample size of 14, so useless. that's why it has very long, wide error bar. But still, the confidence intervals are very much not close to zero, so this is a pretty robust finding. Okay, Amerindian ancestry, they tend to be negative. There's a few positive, especially that one. Mm. Su et al. 5 again, it's the same sample as the other one. Um, but still, overall, the, the simple mean and medians, it, it's pretty much the same, and it's not close to the zero either, the confidence interval. And uh, African ancestry, it varies a bit more, and there's a few more of these small samples that have positive. And, uh, Zhu et al. is again on the wrong side of things. And uh, this correlation is also negative, or the aggregate correlation is negative. <coughs> so we found using three different methods more or less the same results. And you may wonder, <laughs> are these correlations too small? And you can actually predict from theory how large they should be, and they should be about this size. But I won't go into that because it takes too much time. Um, one thing we did see, if we go back to these there's a lot of these studies have very small error bars here, and so they're not really, there's a lot of heterogeneity between the studies, and so you might wonder what explains that. So you have a, a measure of uh, heterogeneity between studies and it's I squared, basically the variance you can't account for by a sampling error, and it's very large. And this modes of the between study variance is not due to sampling errors, it's due to something, some moderator or something. And uh, there are too few studies to do formal moderator analysis, uh, including computation bias, and uh, he would disagree. Yes, but you can analyze the data, it's public. Um, however, there are lots of options, and um, for instance, uh, this trait level in ancestry, when they call European, but if you do European in US, it's actually a mix, it's mostly Northern European. If you do European in uh, Latin America, it's Iberian, it's Southern European. So maybe the thing they call European here is not actually the same trait level, maybe. <laughs> The northern ones are smarter. Um, that's at least the standard finding. And of course, there can be different cultural practices by country, like race discrimination, either affirmative action or actual colorism. You know, don't want to hire people with the wrong color. And um, so these kind of things you could check if you had more data. And then uh, Jan will say you have enough data, and he can do that then. Um, some there is some reason to suspect uh, statistical artifacts with negative bias. And um, these ancestries are estimated using genetic markers. And so if you have more markers, you get more precise estimates. But many of the studies used to only say 100 markers, which gives you not very precise estimates 
i.e. lots of measurement error. And there is one study we could find that gives some uh, estimates of this. So if you use only 15 of these ancestry, ancestry mm -hmm. informative mm -hmm. markers, you get a correlation of only 0.6 or so with the real ancestry, lots of measurement error there. And so you could correct for this uh, if you can make some kind of function that predicts this uh, true score correlation. And uh, if I didn't try this, but you could do this. Um, so future studies, as mentioned before, these results are causing ambiguous because maybe the people we see with more European who have more income, maybe it's not a genetic thing, maybe it's a cultural practice that's inherited down through with the parents. Remember, the, many of these countries are developing countries, so um, this kind of within uh, the common environment effects are probably not zero down there. And uh, you cannot study this with this unless you have these controls. Um, the alternative hypothesis, which is a colorism, basically discriminate against people who are black skin or dark skin or black eyes or this kind of thing. Um, you can study that with the sibling study as proposed by Jensen in 1980, but no one cites that study for some reason. Basically, it works like this. You take families, and if colorism, dis discrimination by color is right, you would expect that within sibling pairs, color also follows the educational pattern. But because there are likely very few genetic markers for color, it would not be very well correlated with ancestry within sibling pairs. So you, these are uncorrelated, more or less, within sibling pairs. And therefore, the colorism theory predicts uh, non-zero associations with skin color and outcomes among siblings. And the genetic model predicts about zero associations within family. And between families, both predict non-zero. So you can test this. Do you find these? Um, and you can do that with the NL S1, for instance, it has the thing here. Um, admixture mapping is complicated technique. You know G was where they look for genes? Yeah. Yes. Admixture mapping is a kind of clever idea of this. It, it, well, if you have two populations that differ genetically in some trait, and you can look at a lot of people, and you can use this, if you know the populations are different genetically in this trait, you can use that to power up your normal G was to find the genes. But it requires that you make the assumption that these two populations do differ genetically for a trait. But if you do that, you can use basically a Bayesian method to get much easier hits. Um, you, you could also use that to see if these things differ in the right regions of the genome uh, to fit with these uh, uh, standard genetic models. Or if it's more of a discrimination, maybe it's like a lot of fake stuff and this kind of thing, like they reported. Um, you can also do the best possible study which is you do this ancestry uh, associations, but you do it among siblings, right? Because they share the common environments. It cannot be a common environment, confound. It must be a bit siblings. And you know, siblings are very similar in ancestry, so it's very tiny, tiny imperceptible differences in ancestry. Maybe one is 50% European, maybe the other one is only 49. But if you have a lot of data, this is enough for a good study. And because it's within siblings, there cannot be a, a, a confound with the, um, the family environment. So that's the kind of thing you can do. Thank you very much. This is just a suggestion. If you're ever going to gather primary data, I don't know whether you're interested in that. But a very common cultural pattern in Latin America is for high status men, especially white ones, to have a legitimate wife with legitimate offspring and a mistress, one or more that are usually of darker skin coloration and lower socioeconomic status. That's how they get to be a mistress. Well, you can do a Francis Galton-like study comparing the legitimate to the illegitimate children of the same guy who are under different environments but share the paternal genome. Yes. That would answer a lot of your questions yeah. if you can get people to report on their mistresses and illegitimate options. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that one, because uh, the answer is I have no money just like everybody else, <laughs> so I can, okay. I can only rely on the data they collect. In Uruguay, when a man dies, you, the widow has to publish in the papers whether there are any natural children of that man. And as my mother said, this is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next question. Uh, my question, we keep saying it could be a transmission of culture. Mm -hmm. But culture doesn't transmit even to adopted children in your own family. That's right, in Western countries. Yeah. In Western, well. 
and, and sometimes it does. In, uh, many of these outcomes, maybe most of them, have to do with income and educational attainment. And if you look at the big analysis, meta-analysis for heritability and common environment on educational attainment, uh, the, the shared environment there is the common environment is about 35% in Western yeah. samples. It's been going down, but it's yeah. still significant. It's probably higher in these countries. Yeah. Most of these samples are not from the US, they're from Brazil and yeah. these kind of I mean, I know, I know we have to keep putting it down as, as Heiner did. We have to keep putting it down. It might be that. Well, it might be. It might be, but... Um, Maybe it's both. I think by now we're saying it's kind of weak, isn't it? You, you cannot really tell what these are. You cannot be that. Okay. Other questions? For low budget, you might use picture analysis. The most powerful argument I saw for a possible genetic effect was a very nice article on how great black scientists have been with what they did in pictures. And the message was how great they were, but I'll confess when I bought it, I could not identify one who seemed to be of pure African descent. And there were several that could have, uh, if, uh, if it wasn't labeled a black, I would, would have noticed a slightly darker skin color. And this was, to me, really striking because of by what the message they were trying to convey was the opposite of what just quick inspection hit me. And, but there's probably a good deal of scope for collecting pictures of prominent people. And then you can detect the skin color from that as a first approximation and get yeah. data. It is actually better than just using as approximation for ancestry because what you're actually getting when you look at the pictures is perceived ancestry, which is the one that's relevant for these discrimination models. Mm -hmm. So if your perceived ancestry does not have any additional predictive power over the genetic ancestry, this colorism model cannot hold. And you're also assuming, and here I look at Cato, it's <coughs> come here, that skin color is negatively perceived. And that's certainly true of the American South. Mm -hmm. It's far less true in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So I think what we have to do is for once forget America on this thing, which I think has set up all the indicators of what we ought to be worried about. We should tell the Brazilian story, which is many people screwed lots of people and no one gave too much of a damn about it. Mm -hmm. But my feeling is the outcomes are very similar even though they are probably not mediated by social prejudices. There's one complexity. I'm told in Brazil, I can't predict who will succeed from skin color, but I can predict the color of his grandchildren, because apparently the, it, people want white wives or their sons at will, and then in turn, if you pick your wives by skin color, your grandchildren will be much lighter. And apparently that's is you know, it's anecdotal, but apparently there's a, like, enough truth to it that they tell the story that Well, I mean, it, mm. once we get reasonable <coughs> genome mapping of Brazilian mm. uh, populations, then we are going to have the test of the socially mediated hypothesis <coughs> that it's prejudicial treatment that has caused uh, <coughs> the retardation, all right? Mm -hmm. It also leads us to the Gregory Cochran hypothesis that, in fact, if the atmosphere is profoundly negative, uh, you may have advantages that way, in that in order to survive, you have to find a, a survival mechanism, which is usually to do work that the host community don't want to do or cannot do, mm -hmm. and then that leads you down a different path. Oh, no. Insofar as education is usually a better proxy for cognitive ability than income, were, were there any studies that looks at the association between ancestry and education controlling for income. Mm -hmm. Perhaps be interesting. There is one study that did that, yes. Uh, but we only analyzed the correlations, which has all of kinds of problems. Yep, there's one study that did that. Okay. Any other matters? Then thank you very much, Emil, for a beautifully presented.